Those of you who have your copy, if you would like to, I would suggest something. Uh, I've made a slight change on mine, and uh, I think it would be a good suggestion. Over the cross. There. Write Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. Always have to make a mistake or forget something, don't we? And I did that. Sunday morning we began talking about this subject of rightly dividing the word of God, word of truth. It is an exceedingly important subject. It is uh, something that we cannot forget or overlook in our study because implicit within that statement of telling us to rightly divide the word of truth is what idea? Not good idea. What's the not good idea here? You can what? You can wrongly divide. You can look at the word of God. You can read it. You can open it up and see a passage or see a phrase or an idea and you think you understand, but you may not. So it teaches us that we've got to be careful. This matters of what we understand the word of God to be saying. It's not just up to us to decide whatever we want it to decide or if it sounds almost right. We need to make sure that we're right in thinking about this is God talking to us. And we ought not to ever think we can just play around with God's words and make it mean whatever we want it mean when it's convenient. So rightly dividing the word of God is exceedingly important. The second thing we looked at is Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, which basically divides the 66 books of the Bible into two sections. In time past, and then he talks about in these last days. Two different sections. But in the section, the time past section, we talked about those two areas, the patriarchal and the mosaical period. What makes a difference between those periods? Here we have a family type religion. Here we have a national religion. A lot of difference between those two. Here we don't have a written law. Here we have a, a written law. A lot of difference between those two. Plus the fact that this was something that included just certain people that God chose to speak to. But this included the nation of the Jews. God called the Jews out, made of them a special nation, and gave them a special law. So there's a distinction then between what we refer to as the patriarchal period of time and the mosaical period of time. Basically, it's just good to think about that this covers, this first section, the book of Genesis, pretty much. And this section then is really the rest of the Old Testament. And technically, into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we see these two sections here in, in the Old Testament. We need to be aware of that when we're reading those particular books. And not just think that there's something said there that we can apply this way or think this way about. There's simply two sections, and we need to understand them. God has a plan, and we talked about that. He emphasized the importance of the seed promise made under the patriarchal period of time. And we're going to say more about that tonight. But that's an important principle that runs all the way through Scripture. And it has a lot to do with, uh, with what the Scripture is about. Now, as we look through those two periods, we came to the end of that particular period of time. And we came to the time of the cross. And that's where we want to begin tonight. I think no one would have any difficulty in me saying that uh, with the events of the cross, everything changed. The cross is the climactic event of Scripture. Anybody have a problem with that? I don't think you would. It is the climactic event of all events in Scripture and needs to be looked at it in that particular way. Everything that precedes it kind of leads up to it. Leads up to the cross. 
once we come to the cross and the events surrounding it, then everything kind of looks back to the cross. The cross is that centerpiece. And that's why we have it illustrated in, on this chart in this particular way, to emphasize the importance of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 2. And this is where this text fits in so well, I think. Ephesians chapter 2. And I said put down 11 through 18 if you want to write that down. But I want us to begin at verse 13. And verse 13 begins with this simple, these simple two words. But now, what's the purpose of having the word but there? What? It's a change. There's a contrast being drawn. All right, think about that. There's a contrast being drawn. But now, and put emphasis upon the now. Now let's go back then and pick up what that change was. Look at verse 11. Therefore, remember that you, who is he writing to? The, 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 yeah, the Gentiles, the Ephesians. He was writing to Gentiles. But, you, that, but therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circum... Who's the circumcision? The Jews. All right. By what is called the circumcision made in flesh by hands, that at that time you, Gentiles, were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. God wasn't talking to you. Do you realize the condition that they were in? They had no problem. Jews at least were told some things in the form of a promise. They had certain covenants of God. They had a familiarity with God that Gentiles did not have. And so he's describing the, the, the condition in which the Gentiles as a, as a group of people found themselves. But now notice verse 13. But, there's that contrast. Now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both one, both Jew and Gentile, became one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. He did away with the Old Testament law. Very clearly he makes that statement. It's abolished. It's gone. So for someone today to appeal back to something in that Old Testament law for authority is what? Mistaken, wrong, an error. You, you don't do that. See, that, that's, that's all been abolished. It's there for us to kind of learn from it's because the Lord left it for us to read and look and be familiar with. It teaches us things from the standpoint of God's dealing with people and all that. So there's some usefulness to it. But as far as a law to look to to follow, it's not there. He broke down that middle wall of partition. He abolished it. That's a strong word. He abolished all of that. Now verse 16. And that he might reconcile. I was reading this this afternoon. And maybe as never before, this 16th verse really kind of... I don't know, just kind of stuck in my mind as, as I thought about the words that are used and how he expresses this. And that he, God, might reconcile them, or Christ, I guess it refers to, Christ might reconcile them both to God in one body. Reconciliation is talking about, it talks about both Jews and Gentiles. It's reconciliation is to God. The place of reconciliation is in one body, and it is how? Through the cross. The central functioning place of the cross is emphasized, thereby, thereby putting to death the enmity. 
And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Great passage of scripture when it comes to talking about this change that is taking place. I referred to the a preceding scripture over here between the other over here on this side a transition scripture I'm not very good at working this thing exodus chapter 2 chapter 6 verses 2 through 8 as moving from here to here now we look at this ephesians passage i told you to put up here is like a transition scripture from here over to here it helps us to see the change that is taking place and so we read this passage and we're pressed. Right? There's other passages like what we've just read from in the book of Ephesians. But it just seems to me such a great passage to teach those particular ideas that are so important to us when it comes to the matter of, uh, of our salvation. This important event, the cross, was followed by another important event. And what was that event? Acts chapter 2. What took place in Acts chapter 2? Day of Pentecost. All right. So here are two important events that we need to have clearly in our minds as a point of transition from the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross for those several days that passed until the time in Acts 2 that we read about the events of Pentecost. Turn to Acts chapter 2. We're probably more familiar with this than maybe a lot of passages in the Bible, and, and that's good that we are, because it is a singularly important event. I, I had a teacher that wrote a book, and he, he wrote it on, all on Acts chapter 2, and he called it the hub of the Bible. Pretty good idea, pretty good way to look at it. The hub of the Bible. So when we're reading Acts chapter 2, we, um, we need to be impressed with the significance of it. We're going to just read some, some from it. When the day of Pentecost, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there, they, and the they is the apostles, look back in verse 26 of the last chapter, the 11 plus Matthias, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there were appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat on each one of each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so this very unusual, miraculous, supernatural event occurred to mark the beginning of this gospel time, the gospel age, and the preaching of the gospel. A significant event that we all need to remember as we, when we read and we study the scripture. To look down in verse 22, Peter preaches. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, knowing him being delivered up by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Notice how he goes back to the cross and begins to preach the cross and talking about Jesus Christ and all that he did, the miracles that he performed, the supernatural acts that he did, and what these people did to him in re rejecting him. Skip down to verse 32. This Jesus, God raised up. The resurrection is significant just as the crucifixion is significant. Without the resurrection, there would be no hope. There would be just a death of a man on a cross. But with the resurrection, it kind of pulls together everything. What we're looking at here and reading about in Acts chapter 2 
is the different parts of uh, the same fabric here. We've talked about the cross, about the resurrection, and now about Pentecost. These are these are transition time from this old time now to the gospel time. And that's what we see taking place here. Look down at verse 36 in Acts 2. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Do you realize who you crucified? Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They realized the terrible condition they were in. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise. Remember that phrase. For the promise is to you. What promise? Well, we've been talking about a promise, haven't we? For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So what we have here then is the beginning of the gospel age. It is a time of the last days. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 talks about, and we talked about earlier. What do most people think about when they hear the phrase, the last days? Maybe it was many of you think that same thing. What do you think their last days refer to? Nobody wants to follow, huh? The end of times. The end of times. That's right. Anybody want to add anything to that? You said what? It's now, isn't it? So when you hear somebody talking about it, and I understand why that they might think that kind of thing. You know, it sounds like the last, we're in the last days. Jesus is about to come and all of that. Well, I don't know. He may, he may be about to come as far as we're concerned. We may not make it out of this classroom, glass building. No, I, we don't know. But the time that began at Pentecost, all the way through the time of the end of the world or judgment is the last days. And the reason why is the last days because we're dealing with the, the last covenant. There's not going to be another covenant. This is the final covenant and God's final dealing with all people. He dealt partly with Jews and gave them a covenant. The Jews a covenant. Didn't give everybody one but gave the Jews one. It's limited. But now the time has come. There's a covenant through Jesus Christ's death upon a cross that has been signed and sealed and delivered to us that we can have assurance and hope in. A covenant established by Jesus that we can be forgiven of our sins. There's no reason to look for another. This is the last days. We've been living in the last days for almost 2,000 years, literally. We're within a decade of that, aren't we? of 2,000 years since Jesus was on earth. And so this is the time that we refer to, that Hebrews chapter 1 refers to as the last days, and not just a short little time at the, uh, at the end of time. Uh, we choose to call this the gospel age. What does the word gospel mean? The good news. The good news, the good news about what? Or who? About Christ. And we need to think about it in that way. It is the center of all that we believe. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. It does several things, doesn't it? You received it, you stand in it, you're saved by it. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried <clears throat> 
and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present. I always thought that's an interesting way that he's described that. You think about that. He, he, brethren, he saw over 500 brethren at once. What's the value of that? What's the value of seeing a, a crowd of 500 people seeing him all at the same time? Witnesses, witnesses. And you have how many all at once seeing the same thing? 500. And then he quickly adds what? Many are still alive. The some are still alive. Why does he tell them that? Because they can verify with those people that they saw. Go ask George. He was there. He's over here. We can ask him. They can verify it. So those words are important that he uses in talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 7, after that he was seen by James and by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of time, by Paul himself. So, so they can bear witness to the fact of who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead, that those things are so and true. What was it that Jesus said that they were to do in Mark 16, verse 15? Go and preach what? Go and preach the gospel. Why do we call this the gospel age? Because the gospel is the thing that needs to be preached. This is the time of the good news about Jesus Christ. We're not talking about Moses as being a man that great as he was, or Abraham as great as he was. We're talking about Jesus, the Son of God, who died upon the cross, who sealed that covenant with his death, giving us the assurance of salvation. When I come to God, God will forgive me. See, that's the point of that. And we can have confidence in our salvation, confidence in our forgiveness. God is ready, more than ready to forgive. He sent his son to die for us. And we need to have that kind of faith and believe that when I pray to God or when I seek forgiveness or someone becomes a Christian, when I was 15 years old, I was kind of late along the way being baptized. There's no doubt in my mind that when I was baptized that Sunday morning, how many of us remember our baptism? Raise your hand. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Out of all the events of life, we remember being baptized. I do. I remember shining my shoes on Saturday night, which Mama always told me to do. And I'm thinking in my mind, I was going to get baptized the next day. She didn't know it. And Dad wasn't Christian at that time. And I'm sure she was the one most surprised at all when I walked down the aisle. Or maybe she, she thought I shouldn't have done that a long time ago. I don't know. <laughs> but all those years have gone by. And I have full confidence in the fact that I was forgiven that day. When Brother Garrison took me, we, I'm going to take the time. <laughs> we had a very unusual baptistry of where I was. Church. This, you'll find interesting. The pulpit stand set up here, but the pulpit set on the, bat, the baptistry was right, right there in the floor. And so in order to be able to have a baptism, always three or four men had come up and take the stand down and put it aside. And then there's a piece of carpet there, they rolled back and they reached down and they pulled up a big hinge and they hooked it on either side and that was the baptistry. And that's where we baptized people, that's where I was baptized. I don't know what, anybody seen a baptistry like that? Did ever love you? All right, good. Kind of an interesting way to have a, bab have a place for a baptism but I remember it all vividly like it was yesterday. And that's, that's the importance of that event. And so Jesus told him to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to who? To everyone. You see, it was a universal religion. Everyone. It wasn't just for the Jews, just a national religion. It wasn't just certain families. 
but it was for everyone. Let's turn to Acts 8 and verse 28, the 25. Acts chapter 8, verse 25. So when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. I try to imagine that in my mind as I read that. Just passing from one village to another village, preaching to people, teaching people. What they were preaching was the gospel because the gospel was the way of salvation. Turn to Acts, the 14th chapter. Verse 1, now it happened in Iconium that they, they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But a multitude of the city was divided part with the Jews, part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with the rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, the cities of Lyconium, and returning to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. See, that's what they did. They were told to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's exactly what they did in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Famous verse, we're all familiar with it. For I am what? Not ashamed of what? The gospel. Why not? For it is the power of God unto salvation, isn't it? So the great passages that we read about the apostles carrying out this message of what Jesus told them to do. In this particular period of time that we're talking about as the gospel period of time, it is Jesus Christ who has all authority. Anybody know what Matthew 28 verses, verse 18 says? All authority. He has all authority, doesn't he? Every, all, everything is bound up in Jesus Christ. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21, 22. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22. I'm reading a lot of passages on purpose. Trying to put some emphasis on the text, what it says. And he put all things under his feet. What's that phrase mean? Put it under his feet. All right, he's picturing this. Everything is underneath him, isn't it? He, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Christ is our authority. Christ is the one that we're to look to. I'm not the authority. You're not either. All of us together aren't. We don't make church laws, quote unquote. It's a scripture that we turn to and that we read and we derive the the teaching of scripture to guide the church and give us direction so that when we look to it, we know how we are to live our lives and how we're to conduct the life of the church, as it were. In this way, then, this seed promise that we've been talking about since way back over here with Abraham in Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3, we read about that. Then in the 22nd chapter, 26th chapter, it was Isaac. Then in the 28th chapter, it was Jacob. The promise was told to each generation. Finally, it came to the, to the Jewish nation and was given to the Jewish nation as we, as we read about in Deuteronomy chapter 29, 1 through 15. But now, what we're going to see is finally going to be fulfilled in Christ. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. And the scripture, see, even scripture quotes scripture, doesn't it? And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham. You ever read that passage and wondered about it? Kind of a strange phrase, but when you see how it's all fitting together, you, no problem with it. 
He preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. There's that seed promise that was repeated over and over again. Look at verse 16, same chapter. Now to Abraham and to his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, quote unquote, who is Christ. And so this promise that was made way over here to Abraham about from his seed shall come someone that shall bless the whole world is Christ, isn't it? That seed promise runs all the way through the Bible. And finally it fulfilled and accomplished in Jesus Christ, isn't it? And then when we come to think about obeying Christ and doing what Christ wants, what we learn is that again, we've got written revelation here. Turn to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. This is an interesting passage. You ought to become more familiar with it in dealing with this particular idea that we're um, talking about because it can be a little bit obscure, I guess, but if you read carefully, you can see he's talking about the giving of revelation. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. So it came from God by revelation, directly, miraculously, supernaturally. As I have briefly written already, he's putting emphasis upon what he wrote. By which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. What we have here is a good scripture to keep in mind when somebody says, well, we, you know, the scripture, the Bible, it's, it's kind of hard, it's kind of difficult. We can't really understand it. And, you, know, this, you can turn to this passage and you can point someone, you can point yourself or point someone to it and say, Paul simply said here very clearly, this is a matter of God's revelation. And even though it's God's revelation, it's not too hard for any of us to understand. It was written down. And you can read it. See, Sunday morning we touched on that point, the value of written revelation. And here Paul is emphasizing it again. And how many times have we all wondered about certain things and we say, well, let's get a given Bible out and I read it. And I'm not sure what I'm reading. I can back up. I can start reading again that passage. I may have to work at it. I may have to think about it a while. I may have to talk to somebody about it. But I can understand it. It's written down. Think how many words I've already said this evening in the last, whatever, 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes. They're gone. What did I say 20 minutes ago? Anybody tell me what I said? You can take a guess at it. But you don't know. And I don't need it. I don't remember what I said. I can tell you generally. But you see, if it's written down, you can go to it and we can read it together. Here's what Ronnie said. In the written revelation. Great value of that, and that's what Paul's talking about here to these people. God has given us written revelation, and we're to be guided by that revelation. Turn to Luke chapter 1. This is, this is an interesting statement that Luke makes at the beginning of his gospel. Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now, it sounds to me like he's saying to Theophilus, 
you heard some things, you were taught some things, and now I'm writing about those things to you, and if there's any question in your mind about them, you can read. And you can be assured of those things being so. That's the value of written revelation. One final passage here. First Corinthians chapter, since I think this is a very important point. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. And we're about to run out of time, aren't we? Partly my fault. 4.6 of 1 Corinthians. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us not to think how. How? Beyond, beyond the things written. What are we as Christians to confine ourselves to those revealed things that we find in Scripture? That's why we say the, the Scripture is where we go. What does the Scripture say? I'm going, to use, I'm going to use it again. Anybody know what I'm referencing? <laughs> yeah. Isn't it good that you have a faith that somebody asks you about? And you can tell them all right. But what's better is you can take your finger and you can put your finger on it. See, read that passage right there. Read this passage over here. Ronnie, why do you teach the things you do? Well, that's because, see that, read that right here. I can put my finger on my faith. And I have a reason for it. And this is God's revelation. This is the inspired word of God give us guidance and direction. Let me just, and the final point I have up there is that the saved, we must obey Christ, and then the saved are Christ's church, body, and kingdom. We didn't get to that, but I did want to get just simply mentioned, ordinarily when I teach on this, um, now I can't get this to work, but this in the middle, either, special priesthood, cl clergy, Sabbath day, instrumental music, thief on the cross, those are all issues that this chart would help you to to sort out and to understand the truth about. Why don't we have instrumental music? We're under Christ's covenant. Did they have it in Jewish time? Yeah, they had it in Jewish time. You can, the Psalms are filled with the references to different instruments, aren't they? But we're not under the, the Old Testament law. We're Christians. We're under Christ's law. And so we can teach our friends that you have this little chart, this idea you can teach your friends that, that simple little idea. The thief on the cross. People say, I want to be saved like the thief on the cross. Well, you're not on a cross and you're not, Christ is not here. So that's going to be a little hard. But if you're being that you, the thief wasn't baptized, and that's usually what they're saying. The thief wasn't baptized and he was saved. I learned, uh, I learned some time ago, I had, had a radio program for many years and, and uh, call in questions. <laughs> Maybe it's a little honoriness in me or not, but, uh, but I, when I would, they'd call and ask about that, I'd, they'd say, well, the, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. I'd, I'd say, how do you know he wasn't? How do you know he wasn't? And they'd want to say, what? No, how do you know he wasn't? And they said, well, he's up there on the cross, and he's right there with Christ, and he could, there was no time. How do you know he wasn't baptized? How? John's baptism. Even Christ's disciples went out. Read John 4, first chapter, several verses of John 4. Christ's disciples were out baptizing. He could have been baptized by them. I don't know whether he was or not. I have no idea, but it doesn't make any difference. Class is over. <laughs>